local counties, they are now in a situation where they just lost out on a hell of a lot of tax revenues over the past three, four months. So they're all trying to reach out to, okay, well, what can we do to regenerate? What can we do to accelerate those revenues? Forcing a lot of the local jurisdictions to take a really hard look at it. When you look at it, it's tax revenues, it's job creation, it's one of the best stimuluses you can have. When we talk about job creation, you don't need to create an industry. It's already created. It's already creating itself. All you need to do as a government body is recognize it. All right, everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Cannabis Corona Report. Thanks for being with us. On today's show, we are going to look back at the previous four months and assess from a macro level how the COVID-19 pandemic has impacted the cannabis industry. And to help us, we're joined by my really good friend, Avis Babillion from SIVA. Avis, welcome to the show. Hi, Dan. Thank you for having me. Well, I'm really excited to have you finally on the show. I've, I'm embarrassed to st- that I've been doing this many shows and I haven't had you on yet. So I'm finally, I'm glad we finally got together. For the listeners, in addition to being one of my best friends in the industry, Avis is also one of my oldest friends. A- Avis, I don't know if you remember this, but we first met back in June of 2014. I was produced our first cannabis convention at the Hard Rock in Las Vegas. And I'll never forget, I mean, I was super stressed. Everything was good. was super mixed up, tons of mistakes, and I, you were about ready to give a presentation. But before you did it, you came like walking up to me, and I was like, oh my gosh, what now? What's next, right? And you just said to me, you go, Dan, I want to introduce myself and let you know how much I appreciate you putting it on this show. And I was like, you know, what a really cool thing to do. And I, you know, I don't know if I ever thanked you, but, but I mean, that was a, a game changer for me. So thanks. No, absolutely. In fact, it's one of the memories that I cherish. Um, it was a really great experience. It was one of my first conferences and trade shows I was exhibiting at. It was really great. It was one of the best relationships. Well, I remember when, when you eventually went up on stage. I mean, you absolutely mesmerized the audience. Even back then, SIVA, you were one of the premier cannabis consulting groups. I mean, in, you have been responsible for winning businesses, licenses in more states and probably than any other company out there. You know, having you on today's show is so important. Your expertise in cannabis is only matched by your expertise in government. And that's kind of where I want to start. If we take a 50,000 foot view of the past four months, can you list two or three of the most important COVID related changes to the industry that you've seen? Sure. So, over the past three, four months, the biggest change, the biggest thing was it just ended up being an unnatural reset. For the industry over the past several years, as we kept building up and building up the industry, as the different opportunities started coming up, a lot of the conversations were starting to go around, when are we going to have this reset? Things are getting a little bit too big and there's not enough of a foundation built up on it. What the shutdowns did was it just kind of took that portion of it away from the industry and said, yeah, it's now time for a reset, whether or not you like it. So it forced a lot of companies to really reevaluate what they're doing, what line of business they're in. Does it make sense to continue? The larger MSOs, they all started falling by dominoes. No. But the bigger changes were, one, just the whole entire reset across the full supply chain, license, client touching, ancillary businesses. Another one was, as it relates to the MSO, they kind of really accelerated their failure, if you will. They were building up a house of cards and the COVID-19 stuff with the investor confidence and everything. It caused them to reset. Another big thing that happened was a lot of the companies that were just barely holding on, it kind of forced them into a situation to reevaluate whether or not they exited the industry, if they restructured their companies. But then again, the greater thing that happened was it just forced people to explore the different opportunities. And I think the biggest change over the past four months has been that mindset. Oh man, that's that's an interesting perspective. It's almost like it was a the bubble burst. I mean, that's kind of what you compare it to. It was a bubble burst, but it was forced on us by a virus. Yeah. I mean, it was either slowly let the air out or just somebody come in with the needle and pop the bubble. <laughs> and as bad as it was, as ugly, ugly as it was, I think in the long term, it was much needed. Yeah, I, I agree too. I've referred to it on this show as a forest fire. I mean, it was it's devastating, but the aftermath, I think there's going to be a lot of positive. You know, one thing 
that I find really helpful is the fact that we were deemed an essential service. And I kind of wanted to get your perspective on this. You know, I feel like it's changed the public perception of, of our industry. And I was wondering if you thought that may eventually lead to more or an increase in states passing pro-cannabis legislation. I do think so, because not too many businesses were deemed essential. It kind of forced the country to really look at cannabis in a different way. And if they weren't aware of cannabis and how far it's come medicinally, recreationally, adult use, it it just forced that conversation. The other really great benefit of it was because of the shutdowns, most of the jurisdictions, city, state, local, county, they are now in a situation where they just lost out on a hell of a lot of tax revenues over the past three, four months. So they're all trying to reach out and see, okay, well, what can we do to regenerate? What can we do to accelerate those revenues? It's forcing a lot of the local jurisdictions to take a really hard look at it. When you look at it, it's tax revenues, it's job creation. It's one of the best stimuluses you can have. When we talk about job creation, you don't need to create an industry. It's already created. It's already creating itself. All you need to do as a government body is recognize it. Well, I couldn't agree with you more. I, I know that you know a lot of the industry sectors are struggling right now. and You know that there's no institutional investors in the cannabis industry. And so most of the money that's come in from an investment standpoint is coming from private investors or cannabis funds. And unfortunately, that's kind of dried up too. I know you help companies raise money and you also help companies invest money into cannabis. So I have a two-part question for you. What advice would you give companies that need to raise money? And part two would be what advice would, would you give people or companies that have money to invest in cannabis? So I think there's a really big uptick in investment. A lot of the investors are sitting home just looking at the industry. They're starting to vet the different opportunities in the industry. A lot of the investment people are starting to understand that you haven't missed the parade. Far from it. This is all just starting out. In fact, a lot of the investments that were happening in the space before the shutdown it really just, I, and I don't like to say stupid money, but it wasn't wise money. If you're looking to raise capital coming out of this, understand that the license does not make your business. You got to have an overall business model. Yes, it's an asset. You got to treat it like an asset, but you have to look at it more as an authorization. With that license, now you can do what you're trying to do. License ownership is not the only way to get into the industry. In fact, a lot of people that are successful don't even have licenses. So mm-hmm. there's value in having a license. There's value in having an overall business model. The overall business model is a lot more important than you having a license or not having a license. Mm -hmm. If you're an investor on the other side of the fence looking to make an investment, understand that you have a lot of options. Before it was different. It's like, well, if you don't take this opportunity, somebody else will or we're going to miss the opportunity. A lot of the investors got caught up in pro forma revenues where everything's great. But as we were seeing now, most of these business models were just not appropriate. They, They weren't thought through. It was more about taking advantage of the hype and capitalizing on the hype than actually executing the business model. So if you're an investor looking at any deal, look at the business opportunity. What is that opportunity? What is your cost of capital? What kind of return are you looking at? Are your projections that are being presented to you, are they all rosy? Does it take into consideration contingencies? I mean, you're looking at the shutdown. Does it take into consideration circumstances and situations like this? So a lot of the investment dollars that really made sense came down to the team that was going to be deploying the capital, the team that was going to be executing on the business model. So you want to look at it more well-rounded as opposed to, oh, here's an opportunity to get into cannabis. Yeah. I mean, those are basic sound advice that apply to every business, but for some reason didn't apply to cannabis a couple of years ago. It was like you said, it was like, if you don't do this, somebody else will, you better do it quick. That's what surprised me with a lot of the investments before. I mean, look, if you're in a position to write a multi-million dollar check, the kind of checks that were being written, you've done something right in life in business to be in a position to write that check. So some of these investments, I'm scratching my head. I'm like, what are you thinking? <laughs> you know, it's like kind of like throwing all the life experience and business experience you got out the window just because it's cannabis. It's like it's no different than any other cannabis and any other industry. Don't throw common sense out the window. Let's switch gears here for a second. A lot of my listeners, you know, unfortunately have lost their jobs. You know, now a lot of them are hearing that entrepreneurial voice is starting to say, hey, let's start a business in the cannabis industry. For those aspiring cannabis entrepreneurs, what cannabis sectors do you see as having opportunities or where would you tell them to explore? See, I would tell them to explore something that's an extension of their background, an extension of their expertise. 
And we saw this when we were working in New York and some other states. Let's say, for example, let's say you're a bunch of doctors looking to get into the cannabis space. Well, why would you go into the cultivation space? Besides the fact that you got money and you can go in as an investor, your medical background, all that stuff, it's not really going to benefit a cultivation company. You, you don't have too many roles in that company. So now when we bring it down to an employee level, and a lot of people have lost their jobs in it. If you're in a position where you've got a great idea for a product, you've got a great idea for a brand and stuff like that, you have to be able to stand behind your product and you've got to be able to stand behind your brand. As far as sectors, I think the more opportunities in the manufacturing sector, that's where you don't necessarily need a license. If you can come out with a good idea for a product or a brand and you can stand behind the product, it's an extension of you, your background and stuff. You can find license holders in any one of these states to license out your IP and let them manufacture and distribute it for you, take you to market, you sit back and you collect your royalties mm -hmm. and your percentage of revenues. So take all your personal experience, take your professional experience, everything that you've done in life and apply to this industry. Look at it. Let's say you, you're coming from an insurance background. Well, this industry has a lot of insurance needs. So I'll give you something, a really simple example, catering company, right? All these events that are being hosted, all these conferences that are being hosted, the local events that are being hosted, most of them have some sort of a catering component element in there. If you happen to be great with food and you can do a catering service, well, apply that to this industry because nobody yeah. else is touching the industry right, right now. Mm -hmm. And this is your opportunity. So it's really taking what you do and applying it to this industry. Yeah. Accounting, legal, yeah. everything. This is, brings me back to a memory that I've had back in the early days when we had the shows. And I remember all of our attendees, for the most part, would come in with this idea that they wanted to get a license. They wanted to open a dispensary. They were going to get a grow. And partway through the conference, they'd be walking across the floor and you could almost see it in their eyes where they're like, this idea hit them. And it had nothing to do with opening up a dispensary. It was just something that they were already doing that wasn't being done in the cannabis industry. It was huge opportunities. And there still are. There's so many things that you could do that are that the cannabis industry needs your expertise in. It doesn't necessarily always have to be in a license or a cultivation facility. Yeah. No, exactly. And that's why, like, all my sessions when we were doing those conferences, licensing was almost uh, always a hit because, like, everybody thought that's all there is to being in the cannabis industry. If you don't have a license, you're not in the industry. Yeah. Far from it. No. So as these guys are walking around the halls and stuff like that, it's like all these light bulbs. It's like, oh, I can do that. <laughs> I can do that. There's yeah. a big need for that. Oh, and I know. That's what it's about. I know, for sure. And now it's actually easier because you have a lot of history to be able to go back on and say, well, that worked, that didn't work. How can I make it better? It's really all about building a better mousetrap. Yeah, yeah. And you don't have to worry about multinational companies coming in and gobbling things up for at least for a while because it's, you know, it's a little ways away from being federally legal. But Avis, we could go on and on. I, I unfortunately running out of time here, but I wanted to let all of our listeners know that if you want any of Avis or Siva's information, we'll have it all in the show notes. And if, you know, if you're looking for a license or building on your brand or investing, these guys are a good place to start. They can give you a lot of good guidance. I'll have all of his information in the show notes and at mjbulls.com. Avis, I'm sorry it took so long to get you on the show, but I'm really glad that we finally got together and let's do it again. <laughs> Likewise, Dan, it's been a really long time. Got to get together soon. Yeah. Thanks for doing this. No, I appreciate everything. Thank you. 